Welcome to the last session of day one, and I promise I will try to finish it on time so that we can go for the attendees reception. So what we are going to talk today is how to set up a secure Spark notebook in a corporate environment and what are the challenges that we face. A Little bit about myself. Uh, for the last 17 years, I design and write software for a living. I currently work in Bloomberg Data Platform team as a distributed system architect. So this is our little agenda for today. We'll first set the context about, in the first place, why we need a notebook for data science activities. Then we'll discuss some of the design and the technological considerations. We'll give a little deep dive into the development and the integration part, followed by a Q&A. So let's talk about why we need a notebook for data science activities in the first place. Now what happened is, uh, a couple of years back in Bloomberg, there was an initiative in the data platform team that we had to create an infrastructure that can, number one, ingest and store the data at its lowest level, basically to build a data lake. And the number two is to provide a tooling across the organization to access the data for different purposes, such as data exploration, analysis, doing machine learning to provide a better service and develop better products. But the most important thing for the organization was not to just create some tools or some platform, but to do it in such a way so that you can provide a consistency across the organizations. You can do things reliably and securely. Now, if I put all these requirements at an abstract in a pictorial view, it looks something like this, where the data is coming from various sources. It gets ingested in a distributed cluster. Then you process and access this data which is stored for different reasons and purpose and needs. But in this presentation, I will focus and talk about how to provide a consistent and secure tooling to access and process the data in a cluster using Spark, because Spark is one of our major distributed processing framework in Bloomberg, which is run in a Eon cluster. So, uh, before we look for the tooling, let's see that what are the organizational requirements for, in general, when you talk about the toolings. While working on these projects and doing some product evaluation on the available products in the market for this purpose, it was evident that the tool needs to be very easy to use. It should be customizable and extensible. And it can be used by different kind of data scientists, not only those people having strong programming background, also for the people who doesn't have a strong programming background may have more familiar with skills like SQL. So we decided to use uh, Jupyter Notebook as our client-side tooling to support a Spark Notebook. Now, let's have a look at what is a Jupyter Notebook for Spark, or rather called Spark Notebook. I will use these two terms interchangeably during my presentation. So the Spark Notebook is a web-based tool. It supports various programming languages like Scala, Python, R, you can name it, and its libraries. You can have a template to start with it. It provides an extensibility point for security and login mechanisms. You can do data discovery, use SQL, and all those kind of things. Now, if I have to put up a stack for the Jupyter Notebook in a plain vanilla form, it looks like it doesn't have much support for Spark. And since Jupyter is a web application, it has to also submit the Spark job over HTTP, which is different than a traditional way to submit a Spark job. So in order to work end-to-end, -end, I have to introduce a few more components. So we have a Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub is actually an extension of the Jupyter Notebook project, which supports a multi-user environment. And we also have the HDFS and the Yarnla, which is running the Spark jobs. So the first open source project that I would like to introduce over here is Spark Magic. Now we had a talk before uh, we were talking about Tori. Now Spark Magic is another Spark kernel for the Jupyter Notebook, which supports various programming languages like Python, Scala, and recently they also started supporting R. Then I would like to introduce another project, which is Levy. Now Levy is a it's an open source project which basically runs a web service, and you can submit a Spark job over HTTP REST to the Levy, and Levy should be able to create and maintain the sessions. Managing the sessions should be able to submit the remote jobs to the Spark cluster. 
Now let us have a look when we run Jupyter Hub, Spark Magic, and Livy in its current state, which is available today. So a user opened up their favorite browser. We are going to log into the Jupyter Hub URL, and it's going to open a new notebook or going to create a notebook. Now once the browser is going to talk to the Jupyter Hub, it's going to submit the HTTP request. The request is going to forward to the Spark Magic kernel, maybe for Scala or Python, depends on the choice of programming language. Spark Magic is basically form the HTTP request and it's going to submit it to Livy over HTTP. Livy is going to create and maintain the Spark sessions and it's going to submit the job to the cluster. The Eon cluster is going to run and finish the job. Once the job is done, it's going to send back the output to the Livy. Livy is going to send back the HTTP response back to Spark Magic. Spark Magic will forward it back to Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub is going to render back to the browser. Now, one of the things that I already highlighted that Jupyter Hub is able to run multiple notebooks in multiple different ways. One of the ways it supports is basically to isolate the different user sessions by creating a sub-processes, one process for per user. And this is what we uh, actually explored. Now, this looks good, but one of our major requirements at an organization level was to use a network authentication protocol called Kerberos. Kerberos is a very widely used uh, authentication protocol across the industries. And one of the key advantage of using Kerberos is when you are talking to multiple services, you don't need to exchange your user ID or the password. Rather, you can use a ticket. Uh, that's the uh, key concept of Kerberos. Kerberos can use any kind of account databases such as your domain active directory. So now what we are going to see is if we are going to introduce Kerberos in our stack of accessing Jupyter Hub to the Spark uh, running in a Eon cluster, how it looks like. So today we have HDFS, which definitely supports Kerberos. We also have Livy, which also does support Kerberos. It is configurable in the Livy. Now one thing that I would like to highlight over here, because this is going to be very important for the rest of the presentation is, HDFS has a concept of supporting something called proxy user. What is a proxy user? The, the proxy user is something where, say you have a super user and you have a regular user. Now if the super user wants to submit a job to the cluster on behalf of the regular user who doesn't have the Kerberos credential, super user can actually impersonate the regular user and submit the job on behalf of the regular user. Now, in order to do that, there is a configuration which is available today in the HDFS configuration called CodeSite.xml, where you can set it up as I put it in a little uh, configuration snippet. So Levy takes advantage of this concept of proxy user. So Levy can have a Levy super user, and in, it can impersonate any user as long as it is part of the Levy super user group. But the unfortunate part in this whole story is, even though HDFS and Levy supports Kerberos, but the Jupyter Hub and the Spark Magic, they don't support Kerberos. So for the rest of the presentations, I will, I will go into the details, what changes you need to make in the Jupyter Hub and the Spark Magic to enable Kerberos. Now, before we go into the details of Jupyter Hub and the Spark Magic changes, let's see how Kerberos works in HDFS and Eon, because this is going to be the basis for the rest of the presentation. And also, I will just give a very brief introduction of how KDC or the Kerberos works. Say so we have a client, which, which could be a traditional client. We have a HDFS and Eon cluster, which is running the Spark job or any kind of other HDFS job, such as Hive. And we have the KDC server. Now, traditionally, KDC server has two essential services, which is important for this part of presentations. One is called the authentication service, and another one is the ticket granting service. And we are going to see how it works. When the HDFS cluster starts up, it talks to the KDC server and it gets something called a service principle and keys. Now, service principle is basically made for every specific, every service that HDFS runs. So if it is running a hive, there will be a service principle for that. So HDFS goes and gets the service principle and the keys. Now the client wants to talk to the HDFS cluster. 
what the client first is going to do is, first the client is going to talk to the KDC authentication service, is going to send probably his authentication information just for the first time, which is the user ID and the password, and it gets a ticket. And this ticket is a user-specific ticket. Now, client, say, wants to talk to one of the service which is running in the HDFS cluster. It could be an HDFS operation, or it could be a Hive query, something like that. Client is going to send that ticket to the ticket granting service, and it will request for a service-specific ticket. Then the KDC is going to send back the service-specific ticket, and then client will use that ticket to send it to the HDFS. HDFS is going to use the service principle and the keys to authenticate and the, the user. Now, once the user is authenticated, now the connection is going to be established between client and server. And in the same time, uh, the name node of the HDFS can go to the Active Directory and get all the roles and permission information out of it. Now let's have Jupyter Hub as a client in this, uh, instead of a traditional client and bring Spark Magic and Libby in the picture and see what changes we need to make. So the first thing I did is I changed the client. Instead of a traditional client, I changed it to a browser. Now, the moment I changed it to a browser, I took up a couple of the communication path because now the communication between the client and the server, in this case, the HDFS cluster, is going to be a little different. Similarly, I have taken some of the other communication also out of the picture because the way now the browser is also going to talk to the ticket granting service is going to be a little different. Now let's introduce the Jupyter Hub and the, Spark, uh, and the Levy. Now you can see that there are two new components that I introduced in a Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub has a concept called, or an extensibility point for authentication purpose. So I introduce a new authenticator, which is called KDC Authenticator. Also, Jupyter Hub has another extensibility point for user session, where basically you, you can inject a piece of code that is going to run for that specific user session, which, which is called a spawner. So I also introduced a KDC spawner, which you can write your own authenticator and your own spawner by, uh, by using that interface that they have provided. So now let's see what are the communications is going to have. Now, as you have seen before that the HDFS cluster, when it starts up, it gets the service principle and the keys. One of the things over here that you have seen that I now have actually four communication points. The client or the browser has to talk to the Jupyter Hub, which is running in a different node or machines or in a cluster or in a farm. Then it's going to talk to Levy. Then the Levy is going to talk to HDFS cluster. Now, splitting this in a multiple nodes and cluster, one of the advantages is the scalability. You can scale them independently based on the need. But the, pro but the challenge is now every point of communication has to authenticate, which means Jupyter Hub has to authenticate the communication or the request from the browser. Levy has to authenticate the communication from the Jupyter Hub, as well as HDFS has to authenticate the Levy. And all these things has to happen seamlessly with the Kerberos. So how that's going to happen, OK? So the same way as the HDFS gets the service principle and the keys when it starts up, the Jupyter Hub and the Levy, they also going to get their own service principle keys. In this case, it's going to be an HTTP kind of service principles, because they are running HTTP service, which is a kind of a service you can set it up in the Kerberos. So it gets the service principle and the tickets. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the communication. So same way, I just put some of the messages on the right-hand side so that is it easy for the presentation. So clients, the same way it sends the request, and it gets the KDC, uh, the ticket from the KDC. Now what the client is going to do is client is going to send a HTTP request to the KDC authenticator. Now the what the KDC authenticator is do is when the KDC authenticator sees a ticket, or sorry, a request, it doesn't know what to do about it. So what it is going to do is it's going to send a 401 authenticate negotiate response back to the browser, which is also known as Penego, which is a authentication for a web scenarios. And this is very common in today's days, and it is already uh, taken care of most of the modern browsers. Now, the moment a browser sees a uh, 401, what it's going to do is it's going to talk to the ticket granting service. You don't need to do any change. That's being implemented inside browser. You may need to enable for some browsers. So it's going to get, talk to the ticket granting service, and the ticket granting service is going to give back the ticket for the Jupyter Hub. Now the browser is going to send another HTTP GET request to the Jupyter Hub. 
now Jupiter hub is ha happy. So what the Jupiter hub is going to do or the changes that we introduce in the Jupiter hub in the, sorry, in the KDC authenticator in this case is, first of all, it supports Penago. Second, it can authenticate using a HTTP service principle and the keys. So these are the changes. And the finally, once it gets authenticated, it can retrieve the user ID. Why it is retrieving the user ID, we will see in the later part of the presentation, why is it important to retrieve the user ID. So once it's authenticated, the connection between the browser and the Jupyter Hub has been established. Now the authenticator is going to send the request or forward the request to the KDC spawner, which essentially means it's going to spawn a new user session. Now what the KDC spawner is going to do is there are a few things. It's going to open a notebook sessions for that specific user, and it's going to take the user ID, which has been extracted by the KDC authenticator, and it's going to encrypt it. Now, the reason it needs to encrypt and put it in an environment variable of that process, because this user ID is now going to be sent it back to the Levy, and Levy is going to use this user ID as a proxy user. You remember I talked about the proxy user? to impersonate the actual user in order to submit the Spark job. Now, we don't want this user ID to be sent between Jupyter Hub and Libby, which are running in two different nodes in a plain text format. That's why we encrypted it. But this is configurable. You may want to send it over plain text if you are not too much concerned about the security. But in our case, we have to encrypt it. The other part of the KDC spawner that it needs to do is, because now the KDC spawner and the Spark Magic, they are going to talk to Levy. So in order to authenticate against Levy, it needs to also get a Kerberos ticket from the ticket granting service the same way browser did, like the 5.6. So it is going to talk to the ticket granting service and say, hey, I need to get a ticket in order to talk to Levy. It's going to get back the ticket. Then it's going to forward the request to the Spark Magic. Now, one of the reasons that we did this step in the KDC spawner is because it is our own spawner. We introduced these changes. We wanted to minimize the code change in the Spark Magic as much as possible, but you could do this also in the context of Spark Magic, basically to get the ticket. Now, what the Spark Magic does, Spark Magic reads the proxy user from the environment variable, and, it, and it's going to put it in the HTTP request body as a proxy user for the Levy, because Spark Magic basically creates the HTTP request in order to submit it to Levy. Then it's going to submit the request to Levy using the same Spinego authentication way like the browser did. And then what Levy is going to do in this case is, Levy is also going to get a ticket from the ticket granting service. Why is that? Because now Levy has to communicate to HDFS. So HDFS is going to authenticate Levy. So HDFS, so Levy is going to go to the ticket granting service and say that, hey, I need a ticket in order for me to authenticate against HDFS service. Now, once it gets it, then it's going to decrypt the proxy user. Now, once the Levy is going to decrypt the proxy user, now when you do a Spark submit, Spark submit has a parameter which is called proxy user, which you can set. Once you set this proxy user, now the Levy super user should be able to impersonate that particular user who is logged in over there. So this is how the whole communication works over here. Now, I understand that now it becomes a very complicated slide. So just to summarize all the changes that happen, and once you submit the request, the AGFS cluster is going to authenticate using its own service principle the same way, so there is no change on that end. And once it is done, yeah, your connection between the Levy and the HDFS cluster has been established. So just to summarize the changes that we have introduced, first of all, on the Jupyter Hub end, we introduce a KDC authenticator. What it does, it basically supports a Spinego authentication for the HTTP service that it is running. KDC spawner, it encrypts the user ID, and it should be able to get a ticket. That's the, one of the way to get ticket is in Kerberos is called knit. You can do the knit and get the uh, ticket to talk to Levy. The changes that we made in the Spark Magic is very minimal, which is basically to introduce the proxy users in the request body for the request that needs to be submitted to Levy. 
And Levy is just going to decrypt the proxy user because we are encrypting the proxy user in the sp uh, spawner so that in between the communication, nobody can change the proxy user because this is very important. Now, all these changes that we made is basically configurable. So you can go to the default mode of the communication without using Kerberos by disabling all these things. Now, before I end this part of the presentations, I'd like to share some of the experience while uh, working with such kind of a different uh, components or uh, integrated environment. Some of the learnings. When you are dealing with something like Kerberos or KDC servers, services running in multiple nodes like Jupyter Hub, Levy, or Eon, and if you need to create key tabs and principles that I was talking about for Kerberos on an on-demand basis because you are now doing a software development, so you might need to modify, change, or create a new. It, it, it has a dependencies to the corporate IT, which means sometimes you may need to wait for a few days in order to get a ticket to be created or get it approved, and which is definitely sometimes becomes a showstopper for development. So what we did is, in order to address this type of issues or not to become a showstopper, we use Docker. So Docker gives us a way to easily create a container for Jupyter Hub, Levy, Kerberos, or even a Hadoop cluster running Eon and Spark. And our goal was to run this end-to-end -end everything in a laptop. And you can do it using Docker very easily because it's a lightweight. You can create all, all the nodes in a Docker, including a KDC server. The, once you use Docker, your networking between these nodes is relatively easy to configure. And on top of that, because now I have a full control of my own KDC server, which is running in laptop, I don't need to depend on any IT uh, or corporate IT. I can create the service principles, key tabs, whatever you need on a demand basis. And maybe you want to run it, all these things in a form. Even for the development, you can also do it in a Docker environment. So I would definitely uh, encourage to uh, you to use Docker not only for a Jupyter Hub or Spark. Every time you are doing any kind of a project that needs a lot of integration and there are multiple nodes uh, that involves in the software development, Docker is a good use of that. With that, I would like to end my presentations and I would again say thank you for coming. And as, as I promised you, I will finish it well before the conference on day one ends. Thank you. Um, my, I guess, first question, uh, great work, and are, are you familiar with the Apache Zeppelin project as well? Yes, we do. Do you have an idea of how this architecture would have changed had it been Apache Zeppelin on the front end as opposed to Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Hub? Okay, now, I, I'm familiar with Zeppelin, but I never tried, honestly, to use Zeppelin on... Uh, the Kerberos on a Zeppelin, but I believe that Zeppelin uses a different kernel, which is Tori. Now, Tori does support Kerberos, what I heard also from the last presentations. Now, of course, uh, the, your cluster supports. Now, one of the reasons that we used uh, Jupyter, it is not because that we did a product evaluation between Zeppelin and uh, Jupyter, uh, because Jupyter we do use in our corporate environment for other purposes, so to become consistent in the environment, that's why we use this Jupyter Hub. But we can check it. Maybe we can uh, see after this that whether, because I'm not sure whether Ju uh, Zeppelin supports Kerberos directly or not. So we use Zeppelin. Okay. Okay. Sure. Hi. Um, so, uh, could you have used like HTTPS from the was it Spark Magic to? Livy instead of uh, encrypting the user. Okay. Yes, you can do HTTPS, but uh, think of a scenario. See, there are two levels of encryption, right? Uh, HTTPS provides a transport level encryptions. Uh, transport level encryption means if the communication between the Spark Magic and the Livy it goes through more than one hub, then it is not guaranteed. So by encrypting this, what we are doing is we are doing a um, uh, kind of a message level encryption. So even if somebody can uh, get this message or hijack this message, not be able to decrypt it. 
basically know what is the user ID, so that's the only reason. But you, you could, in a corporate environment, you can do this. If there are no other questions, um, thank you to the speaker, and we have a reception downstairs in the Expo Hall, which means free food and free other things. So please join us down there um, for the reception. <laughs>